What if the Spartans weren't, in fact, the greatest military power of the ancient Greek world? At least no more nor less than any of the other prominent city-states. And if they weren't, then why have we perpetuated this narrative of warrior supremacy? And what happens when we tear down this myth? Hello, this is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom. You are listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today I'm talking with Mike Cole, an American author of history, fantasy, and science fiction. His emergency response career spans service in the U.S. military, intelligence, law enforcement services, as well as firefighting. He starred in CBS's investigative TV show Hunted and Discovery Channel's Contact. His essays have appeared in the New York Times, Slate, The Daily Beast, Foreign Policy, and The New Republic. Today, however, we will discuss his latest book, The Bronze Lie, Shattering the Myth of Spartan Warrior Supremacy. But before we begin, a quick thank you to our Classical Wisdom Society members who make this podcast possible. If you would like to become a Society member and help support the classics, please go to classicalwisdom.com and click Start Here. Now, what does it mean to challenge the Spartan warrior supremacy myth? So I did want to just start off right away with the premise of your book, sure. The Bronze Lie, Shattering the Myth of Spartan Warrior Supremacy. And maybe you can give us just the, the recap of what The Bronze Lie is. Sure. So um, with the rise of um, Trumpism in 2016, there really was, uh, look, the idea that the Spartans are history's biggest badasses, super warriors, um, that's sort of been a cultural touchstone, uh, I think for most of the world, uh, dating back almost to <clears throat> 480 BC. This is a, a point I made in an article I published in the New Republic in 2019, if, if folks wanna look it up. Um, but uh, there's a professor at the University of Iowa named Sarah Bond who did an article called This Is Not Sparta for a sadly defunct journal now called Adelon. But the article's still available online if people wanna read it, where she went over the Spartan warrior myth and sort of defanged it um, in, a, in a survey function. And I looked at that from my role as a military historian and said, well, the, the pillar of the, the core of this legend of Spartan badassery of them being the toughest warriors ever is in their military record, right? Well, we have their military record, right? We know, we know we have Thucydides, we have Herodotus, we have Xenophon, we have Plutarch, we have Polybius, you know, we have enough sources to check against each other that we can look at their battle record. Did they win? Did they lose? Did they surrender? Is this true? Um, and so all I did, and it's not revolutionary, is I just kept score. And the center of this book is a scorecard where I, I tried to be as comprehensive as I could. I wasn't exhaustive. I certainly don't cover every Spartan military engagement, but I try to cover most of them. And also the diversity of them at sea, on land, in sieges, uh, in skirmishes, surprise, on bad ground, on good ground, and sort of look at that record and spell it out. Um, and uh, the results are, you know, you can predict them. We, the Spartans are human beings. They're average, right? They do good sometimes and they do bad sometimes. And they're not super warriors because nobody is a super warrior. And I knew this going into it because I already had the experience of having worked with Navy SEALs and having worked with um, the CAG uh, in the United States in Iraq. And I know what super warriors are like. I've seen them up close. I've run missions with them. Um, and they are absolutely impressive. And there are reasons why their legends grow, but in the, in the end, people are people. And um, the reason I think that Sarah Bond wrote her article um, and that this became so important is that in 2016, with the sort of rise of, um, of Trumpism and sort of resurgence of right-wing populism around the world, this imagery that I think was really made popular in the 2006 film 300, which of course is based on the 1998 Frank Miller comic book of the same name, went into overdrive and became um, political galvanizing symbols. They always were, certainly Hitler himself used Spartan imagery, but they really uh, adopted a very new and urgent posture post 2016. And look, I thought, I'm not a politician, right? I'm not gonna to go, and I'm not a pundit. I'm not gonna go wade into the political field. But the one thing I could do was tell the truth about Sparta. 
um, and, and lay out that record and then let the public make their own decision based on that. So that was really the impetus behind writing the book. Is there one of the city states that did win the most amount of battles? <laughs> I mean, so this is a question I always get. Well, if the Spartans weren't the toughest, then who were? And, and this is so important to me. Um, and if there's one thing I will hope your listeners take away, no, nobody. Human beings are human beings. Show me a samurai, show me a Nepali Gurkha, show me a Viking Carl, show me a Navy SEAL. They're human beings, which is to say that absolutely elite elitism and elite status in the military is a thing. They have better training. They are selected for greater athleticism or greater heart. They have better equipment. Um, they have social status, which provides a kind of confidence advantage in combat, absolutely. But they run from fights and they give up and surrender and they fumble their firearm and drop it. And they steal, this is another problem too with Praetorianism is we, we culturally, not just us, but around the world, we ascribe ethical superiority to warriors, which is insane. You know, you look at the, the, the character of Eddie Gallagher, not the character, the real life human being of Eddie Gallagher in the United States, who is this vaunted Navy SEALs, a murderer. Um, and, and a murderer who intimidated his colleagues and tried to cover up and sort of has grossly manipulated the media story around his misdeeds. Um, these are human beings. And if there's one thing I would love to bring to the public, and I say this as a man who has spent his life at war, and I've spent my life at war in the special operations community, this notion of praetorism of, of super people, it isn't true. It really isn't. Um, so there is no city state that is uh, has that record that Sparta unjustly holds. And would you have some examples maybe of when the Spartans just weren't the most dominant or successful warriors? I mean, I'm sure there's, there's plenty, but maybe like a few top ones to, so, so to many, color the imagery. Um, right, so many. Uh, and, and, and like the battle for which they are most famous, Thermopylae. Uh, this is yeah. the battle that the, the, the film 300 was made about. And it's just false. It's false. Like that battle was a disaster and everything about that we think we know about it is wrong. It was 300 Spartans on a suicide mission. No, it wasn't. It was at least 1,000. They were part of an army of 7,000 allied Greeks. They were not on a suicide mission. They had every expectation of holding this incredibly superior terrain to starve the Persian army out. And they were absolutely outgeneraled. This was not, there was not some traitor, the, the film and the comic book portray this deformed Spartan, Ephialtes, this traitor who shows a secret goat track around the, the back of, of the Spartan position, which is just nonsense. Uh, Persia at that time is the most sophisticated empire in the world. Uh, I'm sure uh, people who have more expertise uh, in, in Chinese history would probably debate that with me, um, at least in, in, in the Mediterranean world. And they have one of the most sophisticated intelligence and logistic networks. They recon that ground. They knew the path around it. Leonidas thought he could hold it. He couldn't. He was absolutely outgeneraled. He was trapped in that pass and he was killed to a man. It was a defeat, a disastrous defeat. And, it, and what's so shocking about it, or maybe not shocking, is that it became this propaganda phenomenon that is the basis for this notion that the Spartans are supermen. This total loss. You know, this would be like you walking out, the, this would be like you uh, in a basketball game, fumbling a totally easy shot. And then from that being inducted into the hall of fame, like it's just madness. Another example I love to give, it's a far less well-known battle, uh, is the battle of uh, Pylos and Factoria in 425 BC. This is on the Southwest coast of Greece where I visited in 2019. It's one of the most beautiful places on earth. If you can ever go to Pylos, uh, Pylos uh, as it's pronounced in Greek, I really recommend it to you and your listeners. But um, 120 of these elite Spartan warriors were cut off on this tiny one mile long cigar shaped island after having their fleet captured in the most ridiculous caught napping incident, which I won't in the interest of time go into. So this is 120 of Sparta, Sparta's elite Spartiatae, their, their, their peers, the, the, the men who Herodotus would say would abide at their posts and their conquer or die, right? And they were, they had backed up to a sheer cliff, what they believed was a sheer cliff, which covered their rear, and they were preparing to fight to the death. And an enterprising Athenian allied commander was like, I don't think those cliffs are so sheer, and he scaled them and got behind them, um, and they were surrounded. So they surrendered. And uh, 
Thucydides makes this much of it, like, oh, it shocked all of Greece. But if you read between the lines of the interactions between the surrenderees and the Spartan command, it was, they were like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then the, the, the notion is that Spartans who had the temerity to survive by surrendering would be shunned and not allowed to shop and driven out of society. And of course that didn't happen. And it didn't happen because these are 120 husbands, fathers, sons, brothers who had people who loved them and were fit in, 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 and the government of Sparta fought like lions to get them back because that's what human beings do. <laughs> we take care of each other and we form connections to each other. Um, so it's just, and these are just two examples uh, of this. I, in the book, I provide scores of them. It's, it is amazing. I wonder what it is about human nature, though, that we almost like like focusing on defeat. Because, I mean, you always think like the Alamo is another perfect example. Like, why right. do people like the Alamo? You go there and you're like, this was disastrous. Like, <laughs> right, because, this, right. this should have been an embarrassment. Like, this isn't something to... To, to iconize and, and make like such an element of society and history, it, it should be like a shame. Well, it's it, sure. Well, I mean, not just a shame, but like a, a, just a, a really sad loss. Um, look, uh, life is hard, right? Um, not, look, nothing this past four years for sure, but this past year and a half has really shown us that. And it's often very capricious. Um, and I, I don't want to you know, engage in religious philosophy here, but so much of, of what we get in religion and what we get in iconography is attempting to buoy ourselves up from this essential capriciousness to not stare into that abyss and to say that our losses have meaning when the truth is they really don't. <laughs> and it's kind of, we, we, they have the meaning that we build around them. Um, and I do think that these kind of faded defeats like the Alamo you bring up as an excellent example is a, it's a it's it's a case of us for trying to grapple with that grief and to and to form meaning out of it and to avoid staring into the capriciousness of it because how do you get up and go out your door every morning when you know that uh, you know we don't want to turn it into nihilist it's, it's too too hard. So we we have this idea of the Spartans um, being these amazing warriors. Did they see themselves as that? Like when you said earlier that you know that 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 defeat shocked the ancient world. Is part of right. the fact that we have this myth and narrative is because they perpetuated it themselves. Right. Um, so this is a really tough one to answer, and this is another thing that I try to emphasize in the book. Um, so uh, a, a French uh, historian, Francois Ollier, wrote a wonderful book, Le Mirage Spartiate, which means the, the Spartan Mirage, and I love this term because any here's the reality and we have the same problem we try to analyze the Gauls is that here are people who left us no writing. Um, they left us epigraphy, right? There are some inscriptions, but we don't have Spartans talking about Spartans, right? What we have are Spartan fanboys outside the society talking about them. And ancient writers don't have the imperative to objectivity that I think modern historians do. Even modern historians mess this up. Um, but anytime you're engaging in this outside look, you, you know, you have this kind of othering process, which modern historians do more to kind of put, put out of our analysis, but um, in the ancient world, they weren't even trying. Um, so you have myth-making at all times. So the truth is, we don't know how the Spartans conceived of themselves. We have tried very hard to claw an image out of it, but we are looking into a mirage as Olier says, this wavering mist in which everything is a guess. There is some evidence that Sparta was sort of um, high on their own supply, uh, to, to use a, an expression, in the way that they relied on their heavy infantry component uh, and didn't develop um, combined arms capabilities in light infantry and, and the Navy and relied on allies or mercenaries to provide that to them. That's evidence potentially. Um, that sort of uh, that inflexibility. Also, their refusal to extend the citizenship franchise on which their core troop, troops relied, which eventually forced them to arm their slaves, which is an extremely risky prospect because it can lead to slave revolts. Those are tangential indicators that Sparta had this high view of their own um, core heavy infantry function. But one other thing I really want readers to take away and hope listeners will take away is that one of the most important things a responsible historian can do is look into the camera and say, I don't know. <laughs> and, and we hate doing it. Um, and we make a lot of horrible mistakes when we, do, when we refuse to do it. I um, mean, it's one thing I'm very, very committed to doing. Anybody, who's, anybody who tells you that we have a clear view 
of Sparta's self-conception in the ancient world. That's not an accurate statement. The evidence doesn't support it. You know, it's so interesting. Um, we we like saying that that history is written by the victors, um, but it doesn't actually seem to be the case. It seems like history is written by the historians. And um, <laughs> the the funny thing is, is that you think, what is the role of Xenophon in all of this? Because he he really put Sparta on a high, um, just a super high level. Like I mean, he just he worshipped Sparta, and I mean, he really was. The kind of uh, one of our main historians for this time period. So, is, is that like a big factor in this image, uh, this narrative of of Sparta? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he he also was a, a you know this huge uh, personal uh, uh, connector to I guess Alas the second, the Spartan king. Um, and uh, it's it's funny we learn so much about I guess Alas the story from Xenophon's silences because uh, he um, you know he sort of didn't want to talk about the man's defeat. But I love what you just said, that history is written by the historians. Um, and, and this is true because I am part of a wave, right? My whole contextual, we are seeing a movement in classics, less so among amateur military historians like myself. I don't have a PhD, I'm not affiliated with the university. I just really, literally my only qualification is I've spent a life at war and I really like this stuff. Um, but there is certainly a movement in academic classics um, to, suss out those stories, you know, what went on with women, what went on with the poor, what went on in quotidian life. Um, you know, uh, you and I were talking before we started recording about this fascinating object I saw. So when I was in the Archaeological Museum in Pilos, Pilos in um, December 2019, uh, I saw a uh, hot water flask shaped to um, alleviate and very clearly shaped to fit on the abdomen and uh, alleviate a period pain or endometriosis pain uh, for women. And this is in the third century BC. It's the only object of its type I've ever seen. Um, and uh, it was recovered as a grave good and also positioned over the abdomen of the skeleton uh, for where it was recovered. One, there's a couple of things there that really struck me about that object. One is um, a, I've never seen anything like that before. And I spend my life in classical archaeology collections all around the world. We preserve the arms and armor, right? How much has been lost? And there is really a push and a movement in classics right now to right that wrong. Um, Donna Zuckerberg, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's, yes, Mark Zuckerberg's sister, uh, a very, very um, uh, amazing classicist, wrote this book called Not All Dead White Men, which sort of sets the stage uh, for this and is a foundational text in this movement. Um, that are trying to kind of ask these questions. And I'm hugely influenced by this, right? Um, why am I taking this decidedly leftist tack, right? And it's because of the political environment in which I find myself and how I'm influenced by uh, my classics colleagues. So yeah, history is written by the historians. Um, and one more point on that. There's a very famous French historian named Marc Bloch, and I recommend his life in history. Um, and he was a partisan in World War II who founded what we call the Annals School, which I believe very strongly with. And the Annals School's point, Bloch's point, is that historians do not just record history, they participate in it. And by picking the yeah. stories that we tell and by how we tell them, we shape not only our understanding of history, but our future. And his partisan activities and his execution by the Nazis as a partisan was incredibly influential to me. And I really, really firmly believe in that. And I think that your statement there that history is written by the historians is the ultimate analysis expression. So I wanted to put Block's name out there to your listeners for that point. Yeah, it, it really is important, I think, to just try to uncover more about history and knowledge. And like, I try to remind people, you don't have to have an agenda. You can just more of the truth. And that might just be coloring in more background of, of different people that you might not have heard about before or different angles. And, you know, I think that uh, for the love of history, the more we know, the, the better picture we have of it. And, uh, you know, I've I been working a lot with uh, like James Rom and um, Paul Cartledge on Thebes and such. Uh, we did a, a an event for his more recent book, um, The Sacred Band of Thebes. And it's really interesting because Thebes is a very overlooked city state and, um, it's one of those examples of, of people just not really paying any attention to like a whole chapter in ancient history, a huge player. Yeah. Um, but one thing that struck me in the conversation I had with, with James was that uh, Athens was just so ruthless when it came to Thebes and, and they just destroyed the city. They tore down its walls, 
you know, you had this diaspora of Thebans <laughs> that were just like treated horribly. I mean, it's just like a really, you're reading it and you're like, oh, Athens, how could yeah. you? You know, it, it, yeah. it's, it's pretty brutal. And yet you think at the end of the Peloponnesian War, like Sparta famously did not tear down the walls of, right, right. of Athens. And so <laughs> it's interesting that Athens is, is sort of gone down in history for all the sort of cultural uh, and philosophical uh, co uh, co correlations and yet Sparta should not isn't remembered for its clemency and you almost want to say you know this there can be positives in trying to reveal more of a picture like for the Spartan men movement maybe it's good to actually point out the fact yes. that that Sparta was <laughs> humane and respectful of culture and and the arts and philosophy. And, and one of the main reasons they didn't tear down Athens was the, their love of the Athenian theater. Like this yes. should be part of the story. Yeah, so, so this is great. And I definitely want to speak to this, but can I go back to a point you just made before about truth um, yep. before when you were leading into this? Cause I think that's so important. Um, there is a very troubling uh, theme in modern history that I see. And this is primarily driven from the left from my own tribe that all history is political, that there is no truth, that everything is an agenda. Um, and I say this as a guy who's clearly written a very politically motivated history in the bronze lie. Um, and I find that very troubling because other people who believed that there is no truth and that all history is political include the Soviets, the Nazis, like that's not a position that I think is tenable or, or responsible or, or good. And it is definitely a direction in which all discourse not just history is moving. And I find it very troubling. There is truth and there is data and there are things as such things as facts. And yes, we interpret them. Um, and of course, especially in, in ancient history where there's gonna be a paucity of those facts and there will be lacunae and holes in the record that we have to try to fill. It can be tempting to um, you know, fall back on that agenda driven um, position. But I do think it's, critical uh, to our roles as historians to cleave as close to that truth as possible, especially when that truth is uncomfortable to us, when it reveals things that we would rather not be the case. Look, I was raised on the myth of Sparta. I'm, you know, I come out of the United States military. I come out of the intelligence and special operations community. I've been a law enforcement officer. I'm a firefighter. It would be so much more comfortable for me to just accept Sparta as super warrior super warriors and go with that myth. But that's not what the facts tell me. Uh, and so I, I have to tell a different story. So that was just something I really wanted to emphasize because you brought it up so ably. Now on to your actual question uh, about, uh, so you're right, um, Athens did behave horribly. Uh, also Athens was an absolutely monolithic and awful imperial of power, an incredible yeah. <laughs> colonial power, wildly destructive. Um, the idea that the Peloponnesian War, and this was sort of framed in our understanding of the Cold War, that you had a democratic and good Athens and an oligarchic sort of Soviet or evil Sparta, um, it's just not the case. Uh, you had two deeply flawed, uh, both good and triumphant in some ways and awful in some ways powers fighting against each other. You know, people bring up Spartan slavery all the time. Athens were epic slavers. They, yeah. they didn't have a caste-based slavery system, but like you didn't want to work in the silver mines, let me tell you. Um, so I totally agree with you that that dichotomy is nonsense um, and, and, and it's false. And you, you raise a much better point. It was not Spartan clemency that prevented them from engaging with Athenian walls, I would argue. It was Spartan's complete inability to, you know, they, they sucked at siege warfare, they were terrible. And I provide plenty of evidence for this in my book um, that they just, it was something they, they never would invest in, siege engineering and, and something they couldn't figure it out. They outsourced it. Um, and uh, and it, it bit them uh, in the butt uh, throughout their entire history. But you raise a great point here. Um, and it's one I really want to point out, which is that, look, we have this toxic myth that, um, frankly, you know, guys, almost all guys uh, are using and we're using it wrong, right? We're using it to perpetuate toxic masculinity. We're using it to perpetuate stereotypes. Um, you know, look, we live in the age um, where Me Too is, is uh, rightly trying to reverse a lot of these wrongs. Um, it's dragging, um, uh, trying to drag uh, the culture of men in the world uh, into a new era. And 
put on us justly the responsibility of policing our own ranks um, and making sure that um, we redefine what it means to be a man. And that's critical work that's ongoing right now. And at the heart of that is defanging the Spartan myth because it's, it's a pillar of, of, of what makes masculinity toxic. And this is the thing I talk about in the book. So when we see the Spartans as human beings, um, that really helps introduce that nuance that can get rid of that chest beating nonsense that, we, that men need to give up, um, uh, especially now in 2021. And in, I just had an article that came out, uh, or will, rather will be coming out in October in Smithsonian Magazine. And that article contrasts the character of Leonidas, this you know, heroic figure about whom we know almost nothing. Um, at the Battle of Thermopylae, who sacrificed his life. And, you know, for all we know, he goes to the bathroom with his armor on, like he's never, you know, we have no image of him as a lover, as a, as a son, as a, as, a, as a little boy, you know, he's just this bronze statue. Um, and then we have the very real character of Rasidas, who almost nobody has ever heard of. If anybody's ever heard of him, it's because he makes an appearance in an Assassin's Creed video game. And he also was a Spartan general. And we have a lot of information about his life. And what we know about him is that he charged down the gangplank at the Battle of Pelos that I was describing to you before. And like, this is brave, this is, you know, macho, he's charging down this gangplank and it's stupid. It's a, it's a one man gangplank, he's charging down onto a beach, there's five guys on the other end, they throw javelins at him and he, he gets almost killed immediately. And his shield slips off his arm and falls into the sea, it's humiliating. Um, and it's all because he was stupid. If he had just been a little more mature and a little less toxically masculine and didn't go charging in by himself, it might have had a very different outcome. So what you would expect if we believed in the myth of the Spartan super warriors that humiliated by his defeat and having the temerity to survive, he would have committed suicide. But he didn't. He didn't. Instead, he learns. And we now see him in, in Thucydides' later story, heading north to a campaign in Olynthus in northern Greece, where he wins city after city after city without fighting. He uses soft power, he uses diplomacy, he uses coercion, he uses fifth columnists inside cities. You, it's undeniable. It is too different. The Brasidas who charged down that gangplank in 425 BC and the mature guy who learned from his mistakes, who's pursuing soft power in the North later on. And that is the conclusion I've drawn, right? It's not explicitly stated in Thucydides, but man, you can't fail to see it when you see it. And that's the example of Sparta that I want people to take away, is that this guy dealt with humiliation, right? He dealt with defeat and he dealt with it in a mature, um, self-analytical manner. Like that's an example for men, right? That's something that we can learn from, you know? You know, I, I can't remember, uh, I, I certainly use this in a quote in one of my novels is that there's nothing more dangerous than a man who's been embarrassed, right? There's no greater propensity for violence, especially against women. It's, it's just so awful. Um, Margaret Atwood has that incredible quote that's so disturbing and so true, which is that um, men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Women are afraid that men will kill them. Um, that ability to deal with humiliation and deal with it with self-analysis, with learning, and with, with personal progress is so core to how men must change um, now. And we have a lesson in Brasidas in ancient Sparta. And we're missing that lesson because we're looking at Leonidas, this bronze jerk. <laughs> um, so yeah, you make an amazing, amazing point. Um, and, there's, and there are examples from Spartan history to bring it home. Um, yeah, you know, so there's a few thoughts I have. One, to just go back again uh, to historians and how we record history. Uh, you just mentioned this a few times, and I to point out that one of the great superpowers of Thucydides is, is being outside, to being in exile, um, which allowed him to be an outsider looking in. So um, I do think there are roles for not apolitical, but but outsiders are able to sort of see through the, the, the politics on both sides. So like, even for myself, I know I'm a perennial expat. I've lived abroad my whole life. Mm. And so when I look out into the US, it's a very different perspective than when you're in America, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I do always think that that's valuable to, to have kind of a, the ability to have like all the different spectrums uh, of politics to discuss one issue. Um, 
and it's something we try to do a lot, actually, at Classic Wisdom. We recently had a, a symposium on the end of empires and the fall of nations. So kind of relevant. And we had people from all different perspectives. So um, sometimes people got really pissed off with one person in the very left is talking. Sometimes people got really pissed off when somebody in the far right was talking. Um, but, you know, if you can't listen to the opposite side, you're never going to learn. And right. I think it's really, really important to be able to to have an open mind when listening to something that might make you uncomfortable or might question something you always knew or might even have meaning for you, like the symbolism of Spartans. Um, yeah. But learning it doesn't have to mean you're destroying it. And like you just gave in a beautiful example of like a positive lesson. Um, I think rather than just say, try to say like, okay, Spartans are just toxic masculinity. Like, like you said, find the, the cherry pick from the Spartans, cherry pick from the Athenians, find the good and call out the bad. Right. And this is so important now, um, right now, for this moment we're in as a society, um, is that we are in the middle of a social upheaval where discourse is dead. Um, we're on both sides of the political spectrum. And I say this as a committed leftist and social justice advocate. There is a medieval Catholic level inquisitional tone where there is no conversation to be had. You know, you either agree with me or you're canceled. Um, there is no nuance. There is no, um, uh, and it's deadly and it is ripping us apart socially. And institutions are caught up in it now. The government is caught up in it and it scares the hell out of me. Um, and I don't know how we get through it. Um, the only thing I can control is my own participation in it. And I'm actually ashamed of the role I played. I used to be this ardent left-wing agitator online who would dunk on um, uh, uh, political uh, people who disagreed with me politically. And um, one of the big things that changed for me is I moved upstate and became a firefighter. And I had to join this company of ardent Trump voters who would say all kinds of problematic things all the time. And I had to rely on them you know, we're going into a burning building. Like, you know, I have to save their lives and potentially give my life. And then, and they also have to do that for me. And if I'm flipping a table over political differences and refusing to have discourse, that's gonna be destroyed. Um, uh, you know, that social bond will be fractured. Uh, and what I had to do was listen and have conversations, even knowing that my friends on the left would say, well, you're normalizing these bad behaviors. You're part of the problem. You know, this kind of, um, I mean, I don't know how else to say it. This almost Nazi-like uh, Soviet commissar dogma. If you aren't agreeing with me, so you're complicit if you don't agree exactly. And, and, and no, that's not true at all. Uh, you know, my beliefs remain my beliefs and my commitment to social justice hasn't wavered at all. And neither has my commitment to emergency services. I am a warfighter. I am a police officer. I am a firefighter. And I will never stop being those things. Um, and you need me. Right, you need someone whose commitment to leftism to stay in those organizations and not walk away from them, and to continue having those conversations. And that is also something I'm trying to bring to the conversation about Sparta. One of the things I tweeted when the book came out, because of course all my friends on the left were trying to be like, "Yeah," and take the book and use it to bludgeon people on the right, um, which of course it's very useful to do. Um, but no. No, that's not what it's for. I am here to see the Spartans, not to slam the Spartans. Um, and what I really, if one thing I could get from this is for people to appreciate nuance and complexity. Um, and, and look, I'm, I'm costing myself sales and probably sandbagging my own career and taking this position. Um, but I don't want to live in this world, man. Like this is, you know, this current world where all we do is rip each other apart and there is no such thing as a conversation I don't like it. I, and and uh, I, I don't want to be a part of it. I, I totally agree. I think it's it's really tragic that people um, are unwilling to have conversation and uh, are unwilling to see the other side, because the first step really in, in any like massive conflict is to dehumanize the other side. Right. And the second you just make you know, and people are so quick to call names, you know, on, on both ends, you know, it, it, the second you become or a homophobe or bigot or, yeah. you know, uh, whatever they want to be like either side, they, they really become um, eliminating from the conversation. And, right. you know, 
I was talking to a friend the other day who, who was, uh, you know, just saying for himself, like his mother is still taking time to come out, to deal with the fact that he's come out. And he was like, but if I just called her a name and stopped the conversation, I wouldn't give her the, the space to grow and change and learn. Like, where, where is the clemency? Um, where is the ability to see each other as human and to realize like, usually the frustrations and pain people have are, are coming out of their own frustrations and pain. Right. Right. And, and, and once we, we acknowledge that we can like see each other as human and try to help each other. Right. And we get this, some of this from the ancient Greeks, you know, it's so funny. Uh, Herodotus, who is sort of our main source for the battle of Thermopylae does this in turns, right? There's so much othering of the Persians. There's so much description of the Persians as barbarians um, and sort of this marveling at how not Greek they are. Um, yeah. And then, and then there are these moments where Herodotus is either overpowered by or acknowledges the kinship between Greece and Persia. So much of the Spartan relationship with Persia is couched, especially um, by the far right, as this East versus West clash of cultures, uh, which just wasn't true. You know, uh, they were so integrated; it was almost like a family spat, is how I like to describe it. But one of the stories that, um, when he first mentions the Persian immortals, who are these famous um, palace guard, if you will, uh, that attended on the Persian king Xerxes and, and indeed all Persian kings, um, uh, he describes one of them being stationed to guard a tree that uh, Xerxes found particularly beautiful on his travels, I believe it was Xerxes. And this, this love of nature and this love of gardening. And there's this wonderful quote that, um, that um, Herodotus has in describing how Persian noblemen are raised, that they're all taught to do three things, uh, to, to ride a horse, to shoot a bow, and to tell the truth. Um, so there are these tacit acknowledgments of, even while he's othering of, the goodness um, in these other people. So we have examples both of this tendency to other, which is a, frankly a biological tendency, I think, in all species, so I mean specifically, but, uh, but also to, to be forced to confront that nuance. Um, and I think that that's super important uh, to observe. It, it goes all the way back to the beginning of human history. I think that's a, it's a beautiful point. And I love that idea of, of uh, keeping truth and beauty, you know, as, as upholding as positive things. Um, so maybe to, to finish up, uh, what would you say to the people who really dislike your book or, or the, the haters that you, you have experienced? If you were to say something to them to like calm them down or reassure them, right. or give them so, support, what, what would, would you right. say to them? So uh, I, I, I don't do it anymore because uh, I'm, I'm living with someone now and it's not fair to her, but uh, when I would get death threats and I've gotten a few of them, I would always respond with my address and the hours I'm home. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I always say is that uh, this is a warrior story. It's my story to tell and I'm a warrior. Um, uh, so uh, that was my, my first response. And of course, no one, ever took me up on it because the people who send you death threats are 12 year olds and 16 year olds, you know, um, it's never serious stuff. Um, but on a less humorous note, to, you know, uh, Petrus Dukas was the mayor of Sparta um, and a member of Greece's New Democracy Party, which is, it's sort of articulated as center right, but the truth is it's um, uh, really more Trumpian right, I would say. Um, and he was, when I wrote that article in the New Republic, uh, the Sparta fetish is a cultural cancer, which, um, if folks want to Google it, it's, it's online for free. Um, he wrote this post just, at the time I was also a fantasy novelist. He was like, you should stick to fantasy. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, and here's my book. Um, so, so Petrus Dukas, the mayor of Sparta attacked me in the Greek press uh, for my, uh, this New Republic article that I had written. And again, that's available online. If you Google Mike Cole, New Republic, you can read it. And um, he was, he just sort of told me I sucked for lack of a better word. And a lot of my friends on Twitter, we're like, well, you know, ha ha, isn't this great? You tweak the nose of the mayor of Sparta. Um, and my answer was, no, it's not great. It actually breaks my heart um, because that's who this book is for. Um, and I'm not here to, to pick a fight with anyone. Um, so, you know, to the haters, uh, if it satisfies you to know that your hatred of my work makes me sad, then I'm happy to give you that satisfaction, right? Like, I'm not here to, um, to start a fight. Um, and I would also ask you to consider what I'm presenting in this book is a bunch of facts and analysis of those facts, right? I'm not speculating, you know, in a void, right? 
Um, and unless you think that those facts are not correct, um, which I think it's pretty hard to argue, um, then I would ask yourself why you're so triggered by that argument. Why is it so upsetting to you that someone is willing to say, hey, these were not the super warriors that you think they were? Um, I, I'm certainly fine with people making a counter argument, an historical counter argument. Hey, you got this wrong. And in fact, I really want to hear that. One of the great quotes from my friend and mentor, Dr. Michael Livingston, um, whose amazing book, Never Greater Slaughter, uh, I highly recommend people check it out. He's a medievalist and we, we work together. Um, he said that the importance when you're an historian is you have to be committed to getting it right, not to being right. And that is my commitment. So if I'm wrong, I want to know. But if people are really triggered, I mean, look, I've gotten God, 20 death threats, you know, between these articles and this book. Um, you know, if that is the level that merely exp expressing an idea um, brings you to, why? You know, what is your investment in this myth and what does it say about your connection to it that would, um, that would ask you to it? That would be my message. Yeah, it's, it is amazing the power of myth and the power of imagery and, and what role it's playing in people's lives. Um, and, you know, I, mean, I think I saw like Matthew McConaughey tweeting about his Spartan life just like yesterday, you know, yeah. so it, it's, yeah. it's at every layer and every level of society. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I really like the idea the takeaway is not to like say Spartans were bad. It's like almost the exact opposite. It's showing right. them as more well-rounded individuals. Right. Right. I mean, I and, felt, and, I mean, I, I love Sparta. That was one of the reasons why Petrus Dukas' attack broke my heart. Like I love, I didn't, I don't hate Sparta. I love it. I mean, you can't be this intimately involved with something and love it. Oh, and this, you know, if you have a Mohan Lave tattoo, if you like have believed this myth your whole life, um, and it can be kind of embarrassing to have someone come along, and, but, but it's fine, right? You are tracking in the, people always want me to make fun of people who have those beliefs. No. You know, you've been reacting to a cultural touchstone that's been fed to you your whole life. Why is that something to be ashamed of? You know, one of the most powerful and uh, mature things a human being can do is adapt in the face of new information. Perfectly said, perfectly said. Well, I think on that point, uh, uh, we'll end it there and uh, we'll Thank have you. links as well to your book and everyone can check it out and read it for themselves. And uh, as I always say, um, you know, always approach new ideas with an open mind. Uh, and if you can't read it uh, and take it for yourself, then you'll never learn. So it is That's the mark right. of an educated mind to be able to accept an idea without entertaining it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. These are great questions and a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. You can purchase Mike's book, The Bronze Lie, Shattering the Myth of Spartan Warrior Supremacy, on Amazon.com.